ask our, our speaker today. So now let me introduce our speaker for today. So if you joined us last week, you'll already know who he is and you'll already know his bio. But for those of you who are new this week, let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, today we have Dr. Stefan Flugma Corlima, uh, and he will be presenting on the topic of how safe is our food or do we buy toxins in our supermarkets? So Dr. Flugma Corlima recently joined the University of Manitoba as Dean of the Faculty of Clayton H. Riddell Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources. He received his PhD from the University of Munich and has served as a full, a full professor of ecological impact research and ecotoxicology at the Technical University of Berlin. He's also a professor of aquatic ecotoxicology in an urban environment at the University of Helsinki, where he runs a joint laboratory of applied ecotoxicology with the Korean Institute of Science and Technology. He's held administrative roles at the Technical University of Berlin and the University of Helsinki, both of which I just mentioned, in addition to serving the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, the German Research Foundation, Lithuania Research Council, and as an advisory board member of Cancer Research and Biotechnology Te AG in Switzerland. So with that, over to you, Stefan. Thank you very much, Tracy, for the nice introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So yeah, today's lecture is how safe is our food or do we buy toxins in the supermarket? Before we start, I would uh, love to do the um, traditional acknowledgement, if I can get that running, yes. So the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oikri, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Yeah, let's start. Veterinary pharmaceuticals, and we all know that when we buy some meat, we might find some of these pharmaceuticals on our uh, table, or the pharmaceuticals itself, or some residues of these pharmaceuticals in our meat. And when I was a little bit younger, I was thinking about how about fish? And during that time, I was working in Brazil, um, in uh, Recife, and we had a big project from our ministry in Germany um, investigating the quality of water in Brazil. And um, with water quality is also fish are living in the water, the quality of fish they are living in there. So I worked together with a Brazilian company, Cobvale, and they were uh, breeding these tilapia. And um, tilapia fillet is uh, something we, you, you can get in every supermarket. It's a medium priced uh, fish fillet. Um, and uh, if you do it right, it's quite tasty at all. So the aquacultural people in Brazil, they are using mainly these two compounds, which I show you here, oxytetracycline and methyl testosterone in their aquaculture. It's partly land-based um, when the fish are smaller and it then goes when the fish are bigger into these net cages, which are swimming in the Itaparico Reservoir. So oxytetracycline is used uh, to prevent bacterial growth on the fish because in these net cages, there are sometimes virtually really more fish than water and they are just sliding uh, um, on each other. So that's to prevent the bacterial and fungal growth. And methyl testosterone is a hormone which uh, is uh, used to induce a sex change of these tilapia. So this is how it looks like um, when, the, when the fish are coming out of the egg and they are housed in these little net cages in terrestrial pond systems until they are a little bit bigger. And from this time on, the aquaculture people induce this sex change on these fish. So let's see that. Um, and uh, here is one of these ponds um, where they do this sex change because the male fish, they grow faster and bigger and they can be sold faster than the female ones. So what they are doing in these little ponds, they are throwing in 30 kilograms of methyl testosterone per day in this little pond. And you, you see it only when you really start feeding the fish. There are around 50,000 little fish inside that. So 30 kilograms on 50,000 fish. Um, 
European market and uh, Cop Vale is uh, delivering the fillets to, to Europe and the European market requires that there's a body weight which exceeds 600 grams. That means you are looking at a cultivation time of 10 months for this tilapia. So as I said, um, male tilapia grow faster and bigger. So aquaculture works with uh, this induced sex change and this is where methyl testosterone comes into play. Um, this is a, a male hormone and it uh, just uh, suppressed the female hormones and then male, more male fish coming up with that. Um, so let's calculate a little bit. 50,000 fish exposure for roughly 28 days. So that means in total you throw into one of these little ponds around 840 kilograms of this hormone. This is quite a lot because um, the calculation is also that, that not all these hormone is of course taken up by the fish and they take it up in a different way. So not every fish is taken up the same amount. Um, and in total, you end up with this uh, massive amount of chemicals which you are throwing into this little pond. And of course, they have not only one, there's a lot of these ponds. So you can imagine how much of this hormone is used to uh, get the, uh, the male tilapia then. With that, um, you end up with around 90% male in that uh, end, which is then, of course, uh, sold better and they are growing faster than the females. What I was doing is um, we were just uh, taking the tilapia out of the of the net cages from the Itaparico reservoir and we analyzed via LCMSMS um, the hormone content in these fillets and directly from the lake we found that the tilapia contained 3.2 micrograms per kilogram. That's quite a an, quite an high amount of uh, hormones which you would get if you eat it right away. When we came back to Berlin, I was working during that time, uh, as Tracy mentioned, at the Technical University of Berlin. We went to a just normal supermarket. We buy some fillet and we analyzed that and we found it's still 0.4 microgram per kilograms of methyl testosterone, which we can see on our LCMSMS system. So there's still some, some um, hormone inside that and um, maybe uh, we have to calculate that if you eat tilapia fillet every day in a huge amount that might have a strange effect on your body then. But let's move a little bit to the healthy stuff. Uh, healthy stuff, vegetables, and you see that's, that looks uh, really mouse watering when you look at this supermarket. Um, and yeah, but where does this healthy stuff come from? That's a good question. Um, it comes not from the supermarket. Of course, it comes from farmers. And farmers are then maybe using these farms um, in the middle of a desert, uh, only having a small stream, which you can see. I hope you can see the arrow here. Um, on the right-hand side of the slide, there's a little stream coming in. And this stream is used to water these huge fields in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the desert and of course with that you have also in in our places you have pesticides pharmaceuticals heavy metals nanoparticles cyanobacterial toxins which are in present in this water and this water is just used for spray irrigation what you can see in the back here uh, this the spray irrigation device and the water comes directly out of that today i would love to concentrate a little bit on cyanobacterial toxins which develop in these little stagnant water bodies and are due to high nutrient levels they grow massively and that's what we see here that's the issue that's the problem that's Lake Xiaohu in the Anhui province in People's Republic of China I was working there for seven years and uh, that's the fifth biggest lake in China on a very very good day um, as you can see, um, they have some air pollution problems. And of course, when you look at the water, it's green like spinach soup. And that's a wonderful bloom of cyanobacteria, which are in this lake present during nearly whole the year. So the smell is incredible. And um, also when you just think, yeah, going bathing there, you would not do it or taking fish out of that. Mm, it's also something which you have to think about. So 
when you look under the microscope, this green soup, um, then it's wonderful. Um, I, I really enjoy doing that because the forms and the, 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 the shapes are really great from the cyanobacteria. Here in the middle, you have a funny somenon flos aquae, then you have some mycocystis aeruginosa there. So it's wonderful to look at them, but as a toxicologist, I also know when they are decaying, it can look like that. And that's why they are called blue-green algae former times. Now they are called cyanobacteria because they have pigments which are then this blue color. And uh, when they are decaying, then it looks like that and it can even turn into purple. So what they have in parallel is unfortunately they produce a lot of what we call cyanobacterial toxins, but in fact, it's nothing else than secondary metabolites. And there are a lot of them. There are microcystines, and on, on, alone from microcystines, you have a hundred different variants. And this is actually a ring from amino acids. In that case, it's seven amino acids. Then we have nodularine, again, a ring of amino acids. We have uh, BMAA, that's a little amino acid, which is now connected to Alzheimer. We have anatoxin, which is called the southern death factor. So that can kill you uh, quite rapidly. And then we have cylindrospermopsin and other toxins, which can be present in these little cyanobacteria. Um, the natural function is still not really known, whether it's a defense mechanism or a communication mechanisms. But the fact is that, um, yeah, this is a neurotoxin. This can maybe induce Alzheimer. This make you liver and lung cancer. So it's substances which are really not safe for us. When you look at agriculture, and this is uh, the micro agriculture that they have at Lake Chao Hu in China. So they have some, some little fields and um, the water is directly coming from the lake, which is behind the reed here. Uh, and you see that the water going onto the fields is, is green because of cyanobacteria. The plants grow really, really well. And that's because cyanobacteria are able to um, uh, store the, the nitrogen. And nitrogen is a good nutrient for the plants. So the plants are growing very well. And uh, we were thinking on, but what about the toxins? Because the cyanobacteria in this lake, they were highly toxic. So what we did is we just checked that um, and we thought on the consequences. Um, when you look at the supermarket and like this lady here and and you have these these um, these vegetable in your hand, when you eat it, you can't smell the toxin, you can't taste the toxin, and even with a, with a glass, you can't see the toxins. So what you can do is give it to me and we analyze it and we see it with our LCMS MS systems. But of course, being a scientist, we generate an hypothesis. And the hypothesis was toxins are transferred into vegetables via irrigation of agricultural fields. So they end up sooner or later on our table. Um, we did some, some experiments in the lab. That's how we started. Uh, so we made an experiment, which you can see on the left side, we had a, a uh, glass tubes with uh, agar agar and in this agar agar we just put in some toxins and we put in some seeds of alpha alpha to see whether they are germinating whether there are any effects on the plants and when you see the controls are quite big and trying to push this cotton wool out of the glass then you have um, three where we put in one toxin microcystin lr they are significantly smaller and then we have a toxin, also a microcystin. Um, it's not LR, sorry for the typing error, it's RR. And here there's no germination at all. So different toxins, they all look like this here in the front, but different effects on the plant. Um, we looked um, in a system where we, where we had soil. And also here you can see the controls are germinating quite well. The um, plants or the seeds, on the soil where we mix the soil with uh, these toxin with microcystin RR, there was uh, hardly any germination at all. And all this was done within a PhD thesis of my student, Anja Poitert, 
um, years ago. So here you can also see leaves of alpha, alpha um, when the toxin is taken up by the root system. And that shows that the toxin is really like, um, yeah, going up from the root system till the tip of the, of the leaf, killing the plant sooner or later on that. Um, again, some, some, um, ex, uh, some uh, results from the seasons of Anya. And you see, we just exposed the seeds to 0.5 microgram toxin, different toxins, two microcystins and one anatoxin. And you see that even the neurotoxin has tremendous effects on the seed germination on that, uh, which is a surprise because a neurotoxin working on a plant, that's something. But uh, the microcystins, the effect is uh, also very, very well visible on that. So plants suffer when they are taking up these toxins. Um, I had another master thesis from Marika Aulhorn, um, and she was testing the same with spinach variants. And as you can see also on spinach, you can see definitely when a plant is growing up in soil, having a toxin content or are exposed to toxins. We even have, when you look at this Matador variant, we even have a, a very, very early and induced flowering on that. Um, in that age, the plant should not have flowers at all, but this is an effect of toxin. Uh, even in, in that variant in Paris, you see the same. Um, normally the plants stay much smaller than the control plants. And that's spinach exposed only via irrigation to this toxin, which is a microsystem uh, LR on that. Um, some more experiments we did with, uh, in, again, a master thesis, this time Janet Hoffman, and she was using wheat plants. And we just looked at the growth of the root system. So here, left-hand corner, you have uh, the controls, and then you have different toxins, and you can see that the root systems are getting very, very small, um, depending on the toxin, but far away from being normal. And that, of course, has implications on the plant itself, it stays smaller, it's more weak, it can break uh, easier on the wind. Um, and that uh, shows us that the plant is reacting on that, but also shows us that the toxin must be taken up by these plants um, to have these effects on their system. Yeah, and that's what we did. We uh, macerated the plants. We looked really with LCMS MS systems um, how much toxins can we find in the plant itself. So we have the wheat. We uh, looked at the leaves, microcystin LR. We find 0.21 microgram per gram dry weight. Um, in spinach, we have uh, 0 0.3, uh, 0 uh, 0 0.32 microgram per dry weight. Uh, in salad, we have uh, we tested that with BMAA uh, again, 0 0.37 microgram. That was worked with my colleagues in South Africa, Miranda Esterhutzen Lond. She was working with us on that. Then alpha alpha 0.4 and uh, onion uh, uh, 45 to 90 microgram per liter. So that was really a lot which we found in onions on that. The question is, of course, um, what to do with these data. Um, is it safe to eat salad? Is it safe to eat spinach? And uh, think on Popeye, he was always uh, eating the spinach to get his powers. And then think on that, he's getting the toxin in parallel. Um, that's not a very nice idea, I guess. So that's when I was presenting these, these results from the lab on a conference, people were immediately asking, yeah, but you did everything in the lab, but how about the real world? And does it really matter? And um, that's why we set up a research um, at Lake Chaohu in China. Um, this is a picture again from the lake and you see the green stuff in the water, which are cyanobacteria. And uh, I was working in Guatemala at Lake Amititlan and uh, again, a picture from the lake, and you see the same problem, different countries, uh, a high amount of nutrition in the water leads to eutrophication and to blooming of this cyanobacteria. This water in both lakes is so toxic, I would not really recommend even to swim in this water. 
So what we did, um, we looked at agricultural fields around these two lakes um, and um, we just collected the plants from the farmers there. So in uh, Lake Chaohu region, we had uh, Pak Choi. Um, then we have the spring onions and uh, we have uh, the courgette um, on that. So three plants from China. And then in uh, Guatemala, we had tomato and uh, chili pepper. And as you can see with uh, the last column on this table, there is toxin really visible in these plants. Um, in some more, like uh, in the spring onions, 2.3 um, microgram per kilogram dry weight, we even find two different toxins with, the, uh, with these uh, zucchini. We find even three different type of toxins in a high amount. Then uh, from uh, Guatemala, we had 1.6 in the tomatoes, which is fairly high, and in uh, chilies, um, which is even higher on that. So that's what we found. And then imagine you eat that. What happens? Um, so there's the WHO organization, and they said tolerable intake, daily intake, would be for microcystin LR, 0.04 microgram per kilogram body weight. The body weight is calculated always on a body of 60 kilograms. That's just for information. In our experiments, in, in our um, uh, analysis we did with the plants, we found that in 100 gram fresh weight, it contains for pak choy 55.9 micrograms of the toxins. If we recalculate it to the WHO guideline, that means 0 0.9 micrograms per body weight per day for a 60 kilogram person. With the zucchini, it's a 97.6 microgram and a 1.63 microgram per kilogram body weight per day, 60 kilogram um, person. So imagine that both of these values are far beyond this daily tolerable intake, which WHO is telling us for 60 kilograms. Of course, <clears throat> if you wait more, then it uh, will go down again. But if a child is eating that, for example, it has more, even more severe effects on that. Yeah, um, we were thinking on, okay, that's with vegetables, but what about, um, if you make an experiment from seed to seed. So a complete cycle and complete life, life cycle. And we used uh, triticum estivum, we, need, we used wheat on that. So we bought wheat from an organic company to be really sure that nothing is inside which can disturb the experiment. And then we were growing this seed uh, in our facilities and we watered them for 205 days with 10 microgram per liter BMAA. So with this little amino acid, which can or which might can do Alzheimer with you. So red wheat, triticum estivum, is the first most important cereal crop, global production, 650 million metric tons. And it's used for human consumption as well as for the livestock feed. So. The question, of course, was, do we have these BMAA then in our toast sooner or later? Um, and um, yeah, that was then one of the outcomes on that. Um, we found, of course, BMAA in the root system. We found it in the shoot, in the leaves of the plant. And then when the plant started to flower and get the seeds, we analyzed the seeds and we found in the seeds BMAA as well. The standard derivation is, is very high, but still it's it's there, um, even at the lowest point. Uh, and it will be therefore also in the flour, which again is used for making your bread. 0 0.22 microgram per gram of seeds. That's what we found out with our whole life cycle experiment. So what to do? Does it help to wash the food items? Um, and yes, in some cases, it's of course helpful to wash this, uh, to wash the, the food items. For example, with salad, <clears throat> there's a lot of places within these salad heads where water can be uh, stored or where cyanobacteria even can be stored in. And if you wash the leaves, that will help to remove, of course, some of the toxins. 
Um, in case the toxin is taken up into the plant, into the vegetables, certainly no. Then it doesn't help. You can just wash it for weeks. If it's inside a plant cell, there's no way to wash it from that. Um, in, in former times, 20 years ago, um, we, in Germany, we had an issue with apples. Um, apples grow near, um, for, uh, near streets or highways, and you know, we Germans are a little bit crazy. When we go on a highway, we drive really fast. So with 160, 180, 200 kilometers an hour. And that, uh, of course, pollutes the environment around the street a lot. And if you have an apple farm there, then you can really think that um, which comes out of the, the fume of your car will just end up on the surface of your apple. And people were then thinking on, OK, uh, let's make an experiment and um, let's wash the apple and, and see when we can't see any anything of these, for example, benzparines on, on the apple surface again. Um, first of all, washing the apple, rubbing it with a, with a cloth, it removed a bit of the, of the contaminants outside. So just do that. But um, it's not 100%. So the calculation during that time was that you need the whole amount of Lake Bodensee, which is our biggest lake in Germany, um, to wash one apple toxin free. And that will take ages because the apple has a, a waxy surface and it is waxy surface. There's a lot going into which you just can't wash away anymore. So putting out the skin would be one possibility or switching to organic food would be another one. Now, this is some of the publications. Uh, last time people were asking me uh, whether I can send the PDFs. And yes, I do that, of course. Uh, so you can have a read on that. That's only a few of them we, we had during the last uh, yeah, nearly 20 years on that. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, seeing different plants, seeing different results, then just drop me an email and let me know. And I sent you the PDFs right away. Done. With that, um, people are always asking me, do you eat? And yes, I'm still eating. And I enjoy eating. I enjoy cooking. Um, but with some of the things you have to, to think about what to do and how to do it. And yeah, washing the stuff, uh, removing the skin if necessary, that will help doing that. And then you can enjoy your food as best as possible. If you even balance the food, that's even better. If you buy organic food, that's the best you can do. With that, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I'm open for questions. Well, thank you very much. That was really interesting. And, and, and uh, I, I, it's probably slightly depressing in terms of I, I had no idea uh, the extent to which your food is impacted in that way. And so a few things, as we're just waiting for questions to come through, a few things were coming through my, my mind. And you were talking, the, the, the comparison um, that you did in China and Guatemala. So, I mean, would it be different in a North American market? Like, would we see different results if that if that same experiment was done in Canada and the U.S.? I mean, no. I guess what I'm saying, is it better here than it is in other countries or is it just it's the same everywhere? Mm -hmm. I, I have to disappoint you. It's the same everywhere. Okay. Whether, we, whether we go to, to Germany, to Canada, to the U.S., um, mm -hmm. if you irrigate plants with bad water, with water which mm -hmm. is not really clean, or there are toxins inside, um, then you have to think about that these uh, contaminants are really taken up by the plants and they will be stored in the plant and then you have it on your table sooner or later. The, the good thing on this is that the concentrations sometimes are not really high. Um, and that's why I said balance your food. Um, don't eat every time fish, then you get too much of, of the mercury. Uh, mm -hmm. If you eat every day salad, then you might get some other pesticides inside. If you balance that in a good way, that's the best way to go. Then you give your body time to detoxify. And that's what, what happens in our body. So that's where um, the components which are taken up uh, are then detoxified by our liver systems. 
Right. And, and you're saying that, uh, um, you, that, that, um, organic really is better. I, I, because I remember there, there's sometimes there's been things we're saying, is it really just a ploy? Is it just a marking point to say are organic, but, uh, I guess what you're saying is organic generally is better. It's, it's definitely less, um, because of course you can't avoid that an airplane is flying over an organic field. Um, even if it's high up in the sky, there will be some effects on the field system. There will be some effects when the farmer is using his truck to cut the, the fields on that. So, but it's much less than in a, in a normal one. And we have to think about that. Um, otherwise, removing, for example, skins, but then you remove also some vitamin parts, for example, in apple or in potatoes. Right. Yeah. Right. Which we've also been taught that sometimes keeping the skin on is more healthy, as you said, apples and potatoes. So we're having a bunch of questions come in. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to um, look at slide in a second. But we did have one question come through on the YouTube channel, which is where our alumni are watching it right now. And the question is, does cooking have an effect on toxins? Um, when you look at the cyanobacterial toxins, cooking has no effect. You can cook it for half an hour in the microwave. The toxin will not break down. So it, cooking doesn't have a big effect on that. And even if it had, if a toxin would break down into different parts, we don't know the toxicity of these different parts and they can be even more toxic than the parent compounds. Really? Oh, yeah. wow. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Teddy, did you want to bring, okay, perfect. We're having some questions come through. Okay. The first one is with regard to, with regards to hormones, what is the effect on humans that eat the meat from the animals? Um, we, we try to get in hand on that in uh, Ita Parica in Brazil. Uh, it's a very, very small village. And um, when, you, when you go into this village, you see that there are not so many kids around. And that was very, very striking because in Brazil, normally you have a bunch of kids rooming around and there was, there was only a few. We can't really correlate it to the masculine hormone in the food. Um, that would be something to go on, but that was not the main duty in our project. Um, and uh, But we, we can suspect that, that eating everyday um, salad, tomatoes, which is full of masculine your hormones, have an effect on, on reproduction. Yeah. Hmm. We, can't, we can't prove it. Uh, I will not uh, give my right or left hand for that, <laughs> but um, it's something to investigate for sure in the future. Okay, thank you. Next question is, so similar to what I was asking, does certified organic mean that it's guaranteed that the water used for irrigating the food is free of toxins? And I think what you're saying is perhaps not. No, it's not. It's only organic food means there's no additional pesticides. Yeah, that, that's how it is. Um, the same here, if we use water, which is contaminate, uh, con contaminated with other things like cyanobacterial toxins, like heavy metals, like pesticides from other uh, agricultural fields that will be taken up in these organic food as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. Uh, if the toxins are in streams used in watering, wouldn't that affect organic? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I guess that's the point. It, it does affect organic produce too. So I think we've answered that question already about organics. Um, have you ever tested organic vegetables? Yeah, we use it sometimes as a control. Okay. Um, to, to be really sure, you know, you can, that's the, that's the point. If you, if you go into a supermarket and you buy apples, um, then you have to have a control and, uh, organic food was then our control system. So we went to a farmer in Berlin, in Brandenburg, which is certified organic farmer. And we got our controls from him. That's, um, where we get some, and, um, of course we, that's what the, what I said, if it's watered with bad water, with contaminated water, even in the organic food, we see traces of, for example, pesticides. That's clear. Mm -hmm. But for, for the toxin work, it was good because it was uh, toxin free. So that was our, our wonderful zero control. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, so to get fast, fresh, inexpensive food produce, we have to accept there are toxins. What is the personal and social cost to only eat organic food? What a great question. So that's a good question. Um, of course, the, the prices are higher with organic food. That's clear. Um, and 
actually from from my point of view and i have a good colleague at university of helsinki bodo steiner who is working with food systems and he always told me um quality food should not be depending on price it should be for mm -hmm. all on the same level it should not be that people with more money can buy more safe food and uh, he he is working on that um, we we recently applied for h2020 eu project having mm -hmm. that in mind um what we can do to have safe food for everyone and it starts with water it starts mm -hmm. with providing clean water for agriculture that would help a lot um reducing contamination and um bringing safe food to everyone and not only for the one who can afford it right which so many populations on on uh, on earth are, are are suffering from unclean water and and not enough food so yes you you raise a good point more questions coming through I just one came through again on our youtube channel um and it's it's the dose that makes the poison. Is there any urgency to worrying about these toxins, given that most people are healthy and do not eat organic? Mm. Um, yeah, Paracelsus was telling us that. Um, that's that's right. The dose makes the toxin. Um, with the cyanobacterial toxins, you always have to keep in mind there is no antidote. When you reach a certain threshold, mm -hmm. your body will react, and the reaction is cancer. And that's Absolutely. how it is. Um, so um, to a certain extent, our liver can metabolize these toxins and can just uh, put it into a, a pathway, which then will be excreted via urine or feces. So that's OK. But if it's too much, liver cancer, lung cancer, that's mm -hmm. how it is. Um, Were you also mentioning in your presentation about Alzheimer's? Was there an impact on that as well on food or on other diseases besides cancer? Yeah, these, these little amino acid BMAA is, is supposed to make you Alzheimer. So mm. that's um, also something uh, where there is no cue on that. Um, we, we, if, if, if you get bitten by a snake, you get an injection, all done. Yeah, with the antidote. With these toxins, it's not there. Mm -hmm. We only can try to avoid it and to minimize the concentrations we take in. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So more questions from Slido. Um, the next one is, here's a philosophical question. Do you think modern industrial society is anti-life? Uh, no, okay. it's, it's not, but we have to, we have really to, um, to start using our brain. That, that's simple like it is. So I have a PhD student uh, here in, in Manitoba. Uh, he's 65 years old. He is a very, very, um, a successful farmer in the south of Manitoba is now doing the PhD with me and we are exploring what we can do to make agriculture more safe on that and and that's that's a good way to go um so not to be anti-life um, but maybe um yeah producing food which is still high quality um to reasonable prices mm -hmm. and that's that's how it is it all points boils down to money Right. Um, can I afford it? Uh, yes or no? And this should be a question which we should uh, eliminate. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing that food is is increasing with inflation and and through supply chains right now with COVID. So th th this this point that you're raising is particularly yeah. relevant to what all of us are experiencing around the world. Uh, another question came through YouTube, and this is. Uh, sorry, a few of them. As an aside, are there any cultivated produce that naturally produce toxins that can cause health problems if consumed too much? Yeah, some some of the plants they they have they have toxins inside. As you as you know from certainly from the tomatoes, you should not eat the green stuff where the tomatoes is attached to the plant. You should okay. put it out. Right. There's some some toxins into that. Um, with the potatoes, solinaceum, um, they have some toxins. So if the roots coming out already from the potato, you should cut it out, uh, okay. of course. But these are things we, we know since since ages, um, how to handle that. Um, and of course, there are some plants with some ingredients, which if you eat it every day, it would be not, not really healthy on mm -hmm. that side. So yeah, as I said, balanced food, that's the mm -hmm. best way to go. So the old adage, an apple, eat an apple a day, keep the doctor away, not necessarily is, is the case. 
<laughs> in every country, there's another of these sentences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, this is the apple. It's, I think it comes from the UK. The apple a day keeps the doctor away. Mm -hmm. In Germany, we said, drink every day a glass of beer and you will be healthy. That's Bavarian style. That's mm -hmm. my country. The right. French people say a glass of red wine every mm -hmm. day is fine. Uh, so choose whatever you like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Another question from YouTube, and then I'll go back to Slido, is does municipal water treat for cyanobacteria, and is it better to grow your vegetables, if possible, and water using municipal water? Um, the water treatment plant is not made to retain cyanobacterial toxins. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they will go through. Um, and uh, we had uh, unfortunately tested that when I was living seven years in China. Um, we tested the water in our hotel um, and it contains a high amount of cyanotoxins. Mm -hmm. So the water system is not holding them back. There are possibilities. Um, and uh, if the strike goes on, we, we might see each other again. And I talk <laughs> about green liver systems on that. Yeah. Um, that's our systems, which uh, is helpful in just filtering out these toxins before they get used to that. But at the moment, with the normal system, you will just deliver it through the tap. Mm. Okay. All right. Great. I will go back to Slido. There's a number of questions there. Um, oh, uh, so have you specifically tested any agricultural water supplies in Canada for toxins? And if so, what were the results? I would love to do that. I'm since a year here. So this year was full of lockdown and mm -hmm. um, being not able really to, to get things done. Um, but um, now that we are back on campus, at least a few of us, um, we are planning to do this with uh, our freshwater team from the faculty um, to get some water samples, to test them, um, and to see uh, the needs, to talk with the people, to talk with indigenous communities on the need of water um, and what we can do uh, to provide clean water. And clean water is the basis for everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question is, uh, on on the one generation study of wheat, there was a significant amount of toxin in the seeds of the first generation. Did the study examine subsequent generations? Yeah, that's um, that would be great, but we didn't do that um, no. because I was changing to University of Helsinki. So that was uh, the only, we, we did a first generation study on that. But that would be interesting to see to seed in the contaminated seeds and see what happens with that. Mm -hmm. uh, whether there's a further accumulation of toxin or whether there's a depletion of toxin, that's a very good point. And um, maybe we can pick up the work here in Canada and just uh, mm -hmm. do some, some more of this, this work here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, I've been trying to improve my diet with more fruits and vegetables. Now this, totally depressing. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, did you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, I, I, I feel sorry on that. Um, every time when I, when I, on conferences and I tell about these, people are afterwards asking me, what do you eat? Yes. Um, and, and I have to say, I eat, what I like, and mm -hmm. I feel on my body what he needs. And, and that's it. But I'm not exaggerating with food. I love sushi, but I would not eat it every day because I need, I know there comes mercury in that. Mm -hmm. um, I would not eat every day as a German. We love bread. I would not eat it every day in a huge amount because yeah, you never know. There, there might be toxins uh, in the in the flour as well. So right. Yeah, I feel bad on that, but it's better to know it and then we can act on that. Um, yeah, no, you're right. And and I guess the, the 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 one thing that, you know, that does bring Teresa you're mentioning is moderation. I think that's, you know, for what you're mentioning, but also in terms of weight gain and whatnot, moderation really is the key uh, to, to continue to be healthy. So, yeah, uh, um, a question on YouTube is what is a realistic cost analysis for solving cyanobacteria toxins in water? I can I can tell you that, but I won't. Oh, OK. <laughs> because that, that we can discuss if there's really another lecture for me on green liver systems. Uh, I can tell you that um, 
we are having a system in China, which is uh, three times as big as a football field, and it purifies raw water for a five million city uh, to an amount of dollars, which is ridiculous low. Wow. Yeah, so that's that's how it is. I don't say more because then uh, I can skip one of my slides in the next presentation on that. Of course, it's a matter on 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 the dollars again. How much is it? And um, the system we developed is um, for people selling water too low. They don't oh. they don't like it because it's it's very cost effective. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, we're going to go back to Slido, uh, and the question there is, where does BMAA come from? It's a little amino acid, which is synthesized by cyanobacteria. Um, they, they use it, obviously, as a building block in, in growing and developing. It was first detected in uh, flying foxes from the Camorra Islands. Uh, mm -hmm. People are eating that. They eat the flying foxes, and the flying foxes are eating seeds from a palm tree, and the palm tree lives in symbiosis with cyanobacteria. So oh. there, the cyanobacteria toxins comes into the seed. The seed mm -hmm. is eaten by the flying fox. The flying fox is eaten by the humans. And they have some cases of dementia and Alzheimer on these islands. And uh, when the U.S. had a military base on that, they experienced with some soldiers the same. Um, so there, there is a correlation between Alzheimer and BMAA. Um, it's it's still in progress. So that's that's a lot um, to to analyze uh, and to to investigate even nowadays on that. Is but, there on what you were just mentioning? Is there a correlation with aluminum as well on that? As I I think we hear that there use there tends to be an accumulation of aluminum in, in one's uh, brain. Those who suffer from Alzheimer's. Hmm. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm, yeah, my, my BMAA work is really on uptake in plants. Right. Um, okay. Then I have colleagues in South Africa and in, uh, in uh, the US who are really doing the work on the human side. What does it really mean for um, changing brain structures right. and all these things? So mm -hmm. I, I, don't, mm -hmm. I can't comment really on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we're going to go back to YouTube now. And the next question is, would you recommend against algae exposure, such as stagnant water and skincare products? That's interesting. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are some, um, there are some superfoods. Yeah. And I think that goes in that direction. Um, where um, you can buy a box of blue green algae in the in the in the supermarket, and then you take these as superfoods, and and you feel good on that. Um, we analyze these tablets. Um, normally, it's written it's uh, made of spirulina, so it's mm -hmm. an it's an it's a cyanobacterian algae, which is not able to uh, really produce toxins. But analyzing these tablets, we found a huge amount of these toxins inside. And of course, when you think on taking these tablets and out of a sudden you feel with energy, you feel active, right. actually that's your body detoxifying the toxins. Oh. The, the body is reacting on that and that makes yeah. you feel active on that. Then we saw that there are some, some crinkle removers uh, mm -hmm. for the eyes, which are also made of cyanobacteria, and it's it's already blue because of the pigments. Um, putting it on the skin and close to the eye, um, maybe, I would not do that. We didn't analyze that on toxin contents, but um, I would avoid it, simple like it is. Um, I love my life and cancer is bad, so no, I wouldn't okay. do it. Okay, we're going to go back to Slido. The next question is, if water for irrigation is the source of many of these toxins, what can be done in practice to solve the problem? Is mass agriculture problematic? No, mass agriculture would not be the problematic thing. The problematic thing is really providing for whatever agriculture is you are doing, mass agriculture, small one, even urban farming, mm. it's 
water. It's pure water, which is necessary to avoid that plants are contaminated with toxins. Right. Uh, in the city, when we talk about urban farming, then of course we have to have to be realistic that in a city with all the car traffic, the airplane traffic as, as well, there there's so much in the air that to really get super healthy food is difficult. Yeah. But um, it's it doesn't matter on the size of the agricultural uh, enterprise. It's the water which is the basic for everything on that. Right. Right. Pure okay. water, good plants, at least better plants. Better plants. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm just going to put one more call out there for questions. There's been lots of questions, which has been great. People are very engaging. This is a really fascinating topic that I'm sure many of us did not realize the extent uh, to, to which these toxins impact, well, everything, uh, frankly, uh, uh, that we use in our life. And, uh, and better water, cleaner water is the answer. Okay. Another question has come up. Just a second. Let me grab that. Okay. If we want to put it up on screen. Uh, and that is, is there a product one can use at home to filter out these toxins? Um, yes and no, not at the moment. Um, you have these filter system for water. Um, I, I don't want to make a merchandising, but you know which filter systems I mean. So you, you pour the, the water through uh, some raisins and, and, and then um, it, it's better. Um, that that helps a bit. Uh, the raisin is not really filtering out, for example, cyanobacterial toxins. That's not the case. Um, but um, we were working on a system um, in in Berlin, and um, which is the size of a fridge and using aquatic plants to filter the water. Uh, so it looks beautiful and it works. That you have like a like a filter system. Then at the end, clean water on that. Mm -hmm. um, this is what you can do. Um, you can buy at the moment uh, expensive filters, which are made from uh, uh, charcoal. So th uh, these uh, uh, coal systems, which are also helpful, but um, you have really to stick them to the manual, not to overload them. So when they are done, remove it, replace it um, and uh, use a new one and then they are filtering also these toxins out of the water. Okay. All right. It's two a little more bit more expensive on that. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two more questions have come through. So we're going to go to YouTube now, which is mm -hmm. uh, when you suggest that healthy food should be accessible to all, regardless of cost, this is an equality of outcome point of view. What is a market or capital solution for this? Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, and um, we were thinking a lot on that um, and the outcome is that this year or next year we will set up an um, uh, a human uh, an uh, economic geographer here oh, okay. so to, to really um, look at these kind of questions in our faculty um, which are necessary to to really answer i guess and we will cooperate with the faculty of agriculture on that and really to to get these in a holistic way, uh, to see costs, to see effects on on different uh, societies, and um, to figure out what we can do to to provide these good food, safe food for everyone, mm -hmm. as as it is also a human right to have safe water for everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. We are far away from that. Yes, yes. It would be interesting to see all those impacts, as you're saying, in terms of partnering with the various different faculties. So yeah. I think we all we, we need to bring you back and others who are part of that study uh, once that's uh, once you're you're, you're in, in uh, through that study. A few more questions on Slido. So we'll go back to those. And is rainwater collected off my asphalt roof considered safe for watering my garden? Yeah, if you don't eat the grass, uh, if you don't eat the flowers, nothing against that. If you use that, um, you always have to think rainwater is washing through the whole atmosphere. So you have, of course, substances inside which you don't want to have. Um, so having um, this these rainwater barrel behind the house uh, is a good idea to water the grass and the flowers, but yeah, with watering vegetables, it, it might can go wrong. Mm. And that's why that's why um, 
yeah, urban farming has its issues because um, using the water just in the city is washing the whole dust, the whole particles, the whole contaminants in these plants or on the soil where you grow these plants. Okay, two more comments. The first one is, uh, will using household water filters keep up the, the cyanobacteria? If you, yeah, if you use the one which have uh, the, uh, the carbon inside, they will do, yeah. But uh, as I said, don't overload them. Yeah, keep it, keep it to the manual and substitute when necessary. Okay. And just one final comment somebody had is uh, just a comment. I'm shocked that as a Canadian citizen living in Ottawa, I do not have access to safe water. Yeah. Um, ask, ask people uh, in other countries. I was working in, in China. I was working in Guatemala, in South Africa, uh, in South Korea, in Australia. And we all over the world have these issues. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a, a common approach on that and um, to provide that. I was shocked arriving here, hearing that there's a water boiling act. I was shocked because that's pretty new for me in a, in a, in a first world country. And that, that shows me that really we have to have an eye on, on, on water and water quality and providing good water for everyone. And as you, as you know, you know, um, you can live without food for over six months. Uh, you slim down, but three days without water and you are dead. That's how it is. See the priorities. So we have to keep an eye on water and uh, to see that we save these resources. And it's not a big renewable one. Our planet has a certain amount of water. And as long as we are not hit by an ice comet, there will be no more water. The water we used at the moment is used since the dinosaurs. Um, and, and we have to be really careful with that. And we get more and more people. And for that, we, we have to see that each of us has enough clean water to live on. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, I think we're going to leave it there. So thank you so very much, Dr. Fluma Lima, for that really fascinating presentation. And as you can see, we've had 30 minutes of, of constant questions from our, our alumni friends. So thank you to everybody for participating in your wonderful questions, both on YouTube and Slido. We really appreciate it. We will be sending you a link to today's session, as I'm sure you'll probably want to watch it and listen to it again and share with, with many fellow alumni and friends. Uh, we'll also be sending you a survey, a follow-up survey with a few questions. And please do fill it, fill it out. It's the only way that we're able to improve and the only way that we know other topics and and, and uh, speakers that you're, you're interested to to learn from. Uh, I also ask that you please keep watch of your uh, of your inboxes with news about uh, future virtual learning for life sessions over the next several weeks and into 2022. As we navigate this time of labor disruption at the University of Manitoba, uh, Dr. Flumaker Lima has graciously offered to 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 present other topics. And as you can see from his wealth of, of research and knowledge, he, he he has a number of different areas in which to speak on. So we'll, we'll let you know uh, what that looks like from week to week. Uh, we really appreciate your flexibility and understanding during all of this. If you have any questions about this and other programming that's offered, please email our alumni relations team at alumni at umanitoba.ca. Thank you again for participating and we will see you very soon.